Welcome back. Today we're going to be doing lecture number 21, which is on temperature and heat, continued from last time. Remember last time we talked about what happened when we add energy to an object or removed energy from an object. We got a temperature change. The object either heated up or cooled down. Well, let's imagine we have water and we continue to add energy to it until the temperature reaches, let's say, 100 degrees. What happens if we continue to add energy to it? Well, the water starts to boil. We don't have a temperature change, but we have what's called a phase change. Or if we had water and we removed energy from it until it got down to zero degrees centigrade, what would happen if we continue to move, remove energy? Well, it would start to freeze. Again, another kind of phase change. Well, we've got these basic uh, types of materials that we're going to be talking about. We've got solids, liquids, and gases. And those are what we call the phases of the material. And when something goes from one phase to another, we call that a phase change. If an object goes from a solid to a liquid, we call that melting, or we say that it is melting. Or if it goes from a liquid to a solid, we say it's freezing. If it goes from a liquid to a gas, we say it's boiling, or we could say it's evaporating, but evaporating doesn't necessarily take place at that temperature of the phase change that we usually talk about. If it goes from a gas to a liquid, we usually refer to that as condensing. Also, condensing doesn't necessarily have to take place at that uh, temperature of the phase change, but we'll usually reserve that for, we'll usually just, just look at those phase changes at those, uh, those particular temperatures. Objects can actually go from solid directly to a gas or back and or the other way. If a solid goes from a, uh, if a material goes from a solid to a gaseous state, we call that sublimation. There's one very, very common material that you might have seen that actually does that without going through a liquid phase, and that is, if you can guess, dry ice. Dry ice is frozen carbon dioxide. And if you have a piece of uh, dry ice, it will go directly from the solid state to the gaseous state without becoming a liquid in between. So that's called sublimation. If we go from a gaseous to a solid state directly without going through the liquid state, that's sometimes referred to as condensation, sometimes referred to as nucleation. We will basically stick with the, the transitions solid and liquid back and forth, and then liquid and gas back and forth. Now, it is a very, very amazing result that to have a phase change requires the input or removal of energy, but without a temperature change. So an object will actually undergo a phase change, like uh, ice at zero degrees centigrade will turn into water, liquid water, at zero degrees centigrade, but we have to put energy into it. So to get that phase change, we have to put in energy, but we do not get a temperature change during that phase change. And likewise, we would have to take energy out of the liquid water at zero degrees to turn it into solid ice at zero degrees. So let's talk about those energies. How much energy is actually required for those phase changes? Remember from last time, when we have a temperature change, in other words, no phase change, we had Q was equal to MC delta T. This was the energy that would have to be added to the material to get that temperature change, where M was the mass of the material, delta T was the temperature change, and then C was the specific heat of the material. And the units of C are joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Now, when we have a phase change with no temperature change, the amount of heat that we have to add, Q, is equal to ML, where again, M is the mass of the object, but L is then what we call the latent heat. And the latent heat has the units of joules per kilogram. Now, there are three latent heats, but we'll only be worried about two of them. If we have a phase change between the solid and the liquid, either way, back or forth, we use the latent heat of fusion, and we'll label that as L sub F. If we're going from a liquid to a gas, one way or the other, we use the latent heat of vaporization, L sub V. Now, we're really not going to worry about sublimation, but if you were to go from a solid to a gas, you would use the latent heat of sublimation, which is L sub S. Now, remember, if you want to go to a solid to a liquid, you have to add heat. If you want to go from a liquid to a solid, you remove heat. Likewise, if you want to go from a liquid to a gas, you add heat. And if you want to go from a gas to a liquid, you remove heat. Okay, great. Let's stick some numbers in here. So, 
How much energy does it take to heat 2.50 kilograms of ice at negative 10 degrees Celsius and turn it into steam at 100 degrees Celsius? In other words, into a gaseous state at 100 degrees Celsius. Well, let's think about this. We have to do this in parts. Let's think about what steps we need to take. First, we have ice at negative 10 degrees Celsius. If we start adding heat to it, what's going to happen to the ice? Well, it's not going to melt because ice melts at zero degrees and the ice is not at zero degrees yet. So the first thing we have to do is to heat the ice to zero degrees centigrade. So we'll figure that out. How much energy do we have to put into the ice to heat it to zero degrees? Well, then if we continue to add energy to the ice, then what's going to happen? Well, then the ice will start to melt. So then we will melt the ice at zero degrees centigrade. Now, let's imagine we've added enough energy to melt all the ice. What do we have at that point? We have water at zero degrees centigrade. That was a phase change. So this is a temperature change. This is a phase change. If we continue to add energy to the water, now what's going to happen? Well, it's not going to boil yet because water doesn't boil until it gets to 100 degrees centigrade. We have to heat the water from zero to 100 degrees. So the next step is heat the water to 100 degrees. Then if we continue to add energy, then the water will start to boil. So then we will boil the water at 100 degrees centigrade. There we go. That will have then turned it into steam at 100 degrees centigrade. Again, there's a phase change. So here's temperature change, phase change, temperature change, phase change. Then we will finally end up with what we want, steam at 100 degrees centigrade. So let's do each of those parts. So when we do these, ask yourself, do we have a temperature change or a phase change? Temperature change, Q equals MC delta T. Phase change, Q equals ML. All right, so heat ice from negative 10 degrees to 100 de uh, zero degrees, what is that? Temperature change. So we'll call this energy Q1. It's a temperature change, so Q1 equals MC delta T. What's M? That's the mass, 2.50 kilograms times C. Now, let's be careful. What specific heat do we want? Well, what is it that we're heating? We're heating ice. So we need the specific heat of ice. Now that is 2.00 times 10 to the 3 kilo uh, joules per kilogram degree centigrade. Now, how much are we heating it? Well, we're heating it from negative 10 to 0 degrees. That's a delta T of 10 degrees. So times 10 degrees centigrade. Multiply that all out, and what do we get? We get 5.00 times 10 to the fourth joules. There we go. So that is the amount of energy we would have to add to the ice to heat it from negative 10 degrees to 0 degrees. Now we continue to add energy. What happens? We melt the ice. So how much energy do we have to add to melt all of the ice? Temperature change or phase change? That's a phase change. We'll call this Q2. This will equal ML. Now, what L do we want? Well, this is a, a solid liquid phase change. Which phase change is that? That's the latent heat of fusion. So we're going to use L sub F. What's M? Again, 2.50 kilograms. What is the latent heat of fusion? It is 3.35 times 10 to the fifth joules per kilogram. That's the latent heat of fusion for, uh, for water, H2O, between the liquid and solid state. Multiplying this out, and what do we get? We get 8.38 times 10 to the fifth joules. All right, great. So now let's assume we've got melted ice, which is liquid water at zero degrees. We need to heat that to 100 degrees. Is that a temperature change or a phase change? 
That's a temperature change, so we'll call this Q3. The temperature change is Mc delta T. Again, same mass, 2.50 kilograms. Now, what specific heat do we want? Well, we want the specific heat of water, which is 4,186 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. What's the temperature change? Well, we're going from 0 to 100 degrees. That's a delta T of 100 degrees. Multiply that all out, and what do we get? We get 1.05 times 10 to the 6th joules. There we go. Last step. We now have water at 100 degrees. We want to boil that water and turn it into steam at 100 degrees. Is that a temperature change or a phase change? That's a phase change. So this last step, we'll call this Q4. This is ML. Now, what latent heat do we want? Well, this is the liquid gas phase change, so that's vaporization, latent heat of vaporization. So what do we get? Same mass, 2.50 kilograms times the latent heat of vaporization, that is 2.26 times 10 to the 6th joules per kilogram. Multiply that out and we get 5.65 times 10 to the 6th joules. Very, very good. Now, one thing I just want us to notice before we go on is look at the size of these numbers. Each step gets bigger and bigger. Now, part of that has to do with the fact that we chose a temperature of negative 10 degrees. If it was less than that, this one, this number would have been bigger. But what I in particular want to point out is the entire melting, heating of the water, and uh, uh, boiling off the water the largest one is the boiling of the water. Now that helps explain why steam can burn you so badly. If you've ever accidentally put your hand in front of like a, a, a teapot or something like that that's spewing out, spewing out steam and it accidentally hit your hand, what happens when steam hits your skin? Well, it condenses back to liquid water. Where does that heat go from that phase change? Well, it goes into you, it goes into your skin and that can, can uh, really burn you badly because that steam has so much energy in it. Because it took so much energy to turn it into steam from liquid water in the first place. Okay, there we go. So what's the total amount of energy that we would have to add? Well, we would have to just add these four down here. Adding those together, what do we get? We get a total of 7.59 times 10 to the 6th. Joules. There we go. So that is the answer. That is the total amount of energy required to convert 2.50 kilograms of ice at negative 10 degrees centigrade to steam at 100 degrees centigrade. All right. Excellent. Now, what we're going to do for the rest of the time is look at a particular type of problem that I want to spend quite a bit of time looking at. And I hate to tell you this, but a lot of my students have told me that this is the hardest type of problem that we do in this course. So, just as a warning, it's not that any particular step is difficult, but it's a little bit tricky to keep track of everything that we're doing and to understand how each step moves into the next one. So, got to be a little bit careful. I'm going to do this problem a couple of different ways and you can choose either way you want, although it is really, really important to be able to understand all of the different ones because sometimes you might want to switch from one approach to another to make it easier to actually solve the problem. Okay, here we go. So here's the problem. A calorimeter contains 800 grams of water at 10 degrees centigrade. A block of 500 grams of ice, is at, uh, of ice at negative 15 degrees centigrade is added. What is the final temperature, how much ice, and how much water are left at equilibrium? So first, the calorimeter part. Why do we have this in a calorimeter? That's just to emphasize that we're not going to gain or lose any heat from the environment. Any exchange, any heat exchange that's going to take place is only going to be between the water and the ice. So that's, that's the important point. We're, we're not losing or gaining any other heat. What's going to happen? 
We've got warm water, in other words, water that's warmer than the ice. We've got cold ice, ice that's colder than the water. We put them together. What's going to happen? Well, the water will cool down. It's going to give energy to the ice. The ice will warm up. It will take energy from the water. That will continue until equilibrium. What does equilibrium mean? Until they're both at the same temperature. Now the problem is that we're not sure what that final equilibrium temperature is going to be. What are some possible alternatives? Well, let's look at some extreme situations. Imagine we have some very hot water and a small amount of ice. We put the ice in the hot water, what's going to happen? The ice will warm up to zero degrees, it will all melt, and then that melted water will warm up to whatever the final equilibrium temperature is of the original water as it cooled down, as it gave the energy to the ice. We'll end up with all of the result being water, no ice, at some temperature above zero degrees. What if we had a large amount of ice and a small amount of water? Well, that water would cool down and freeze. Imagine we put a drop of water on an on a iceberg or something like that. That drop of water would freeze. We would end up with everything being ice at some temperature below zero. What if a typical glass of ice water, we just took some ice, put it in water, the water cools down, we end up with some of the ice melting, we end up with ice and water together, a mixture, at zero degrees centigrade. So the, what makes these problems difficult is we're not sure what we're going to end up with. We have to figure out what we're going to end up with as we go through the problem. That's what some students find to be difficult. We have to keep track of these steps that will help us figure out what we're going to end up with as we go along. Okay, so let's think about this. We know that if there's going to be any phase change, that phase change is going to have to happen at zero degrees. We don't get any phase change with water. In this case, with ice and water, we don't have to worry about anything boiling because everything is down close to zero. The only phase change that's going to occur is if the water freezes at zero degrees or if the ice melts at zero degrees. So the first thing we can ask ourselves is, as energy goes from the water to the ice, will the water cool down to zero first or will the ice warm up to zero first? Well, let's look at how much energy the water would give up in cooling to zero and how much energy the ice needs to absorb to get up to zero first. To cool the water to zero degrees, the amount of energy that the water would give up if it were going to cool all the way to zero degrees, we'll call that Q1. That's a temperature change, so that's mc delta t. The mass, we're talking about the mass of the water, that's 800 grams or 0.8 kilograms. The specific heat is the specific heat of water, 4186 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. The temperature change, now we're going from 10 degrees to zero. You could say that's negative 10, but I'm just going to look at how much energy would the water give up as opposed to what's the, what's the energy change of the water, which would be negative. We'll just look at how much would it give up as a positive number. So we'll say that that's 10 degrees. Multiply that out, 3.35 times 10 to the fourth joules. How much energy would the ice need to absorb if it were to get all the way up to zero degrees? Well, to heat the ice to zero, again, that's a temperature change. Q2 is mc delta t, but what's the m? m is the mass of the ice in this case, 500 grams, 0.5 kilograms. The specific heat of ice. Now, all of these specific heats and latent heats, you do not need to remember those. I will give you those. So that's not something you have to memorize. Even on an exam, I'll give them to you on an exam. The temperature change, we're going from negative 15 to zero. That's a temperature change of 15 degrees, which gives us 1.50 times 10 to the fourth joules. Notice, the ice would need 1.5 times 10 to the fourth. The water can give 3.35 times 10 to the fourth. The water has more than enough energy to give energy to the ice and get the ice all the way to zero. So what's going to happen? As the water cools and the ice heats, the ice will get to zero first. After the water has given the ice 1.50 times 10 to the fourth joules. 
So let's imagine that happens. Let's say that the water gives ice the 1.50 times 10 to the fourth joules. What do we have now? We now have ice at zero degrees centigrade. But the water has cooled down. Now, we could figure out what that temperature of the water is, but what's important is how much energy can the water continue to give to the ice because they're still not at the same temperature yet. The water is still above zero. It has not given all of that 3.3 times 10 to the fourth. How much more energy can the water give? Well, it can give an amount 3.35 times 10 to the fourth minus 1.5 times 10 to the fourth. Let's do that. 